All right, everyone. Welcome back. Good morning. Welcome to B Sides Las Vegas. This is Passwords Con. This talk is passwords, policies, securing, cracking, and more, given by Derek Melber. A few announcements before we begin. We'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, SemGrep, Blue Cat, and Toyota. It's their support, along with all of our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. And of course, thank you to all of you for coming to B-Sides Las Vegas. These talks are being streamed live, and as a courtesy to our speakers, please make sure that your cell phones are set to silent at this time. Also, as a reminder, you may be, uh, Las Vegas B-Size LV photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the explicit permission of everyone in frame. These will be made available to you on YouTube in the future. If you do have a question towards the end of the talk, I have a microphone here. Please just raise your hand when the time comes and I will come around with a microphone. Please do not start asking your question until the microphone makes it to you so that YouTube can start hearing you. With that, please take it away, Derek. Awesome, thank you. So, oh, am I on? Am I good? Everyone hear me? Good, awesome, fantastic. Well, I also want to thank you for um, getting up in Vegas and arriving here, I appreciate that. Um, hopefully everybody's having a very good week. Um, uh, you want me to turn it up here? Hold on. How about that? Uh, better? 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 How about that? Okay, good. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, so I, I normally do an introduction and kind of talk about my background, but the last couple of weeks have been interesting. The company I was working for um, went out of business. So kind of in a little bit of a flux right now. So I guess I'm an independent contractor, um, <laughs> which I did for a long time, but um, it, it was a very interesting June and July when the company um, lets go of 55 people, all of sales and marketing in the United States in one go. And then six weeks later, um, hey, guess what? We're all unemployed. Um, so if you were using software from that company, um, which I'm being recorded, so I won't say it, um, you no longer have access to that software. I'm very sorry, because they removed access to the software as well on July 31st. So um, very interesting times. But um, it is great to be here. Um, I do a lot of talks um, throughout the year. I probably do about 25 to 30 presentations. Um, this year I've had the honor of speaking at um, RSA, Gartner, FSISAC, Identiverse, if you've ever heard of that. Um, so it, it's good to be here. And this particular talk, um, I actually pulled out of the archive. Um, I used to do this talk quite a bit in the past. Um, and then of course, passwords kind of fell to the wayside and people said, get rid of passwords and whatnot. But I thought it was appropriate to kind of bring it back because let's be honest, in Windows, Active Directory, we're not gonna get rid of passwords anytime soon, right? It's just not going to happen. So I, I, I wanted to kind of go over a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. Obviously I can't go over everything I wanna go over because we don't have enough time, but what I wanna do is kind of engage you with some information that maybe you weren't aware of to show you how password policies work within Active Directory as well as Azure Active, I'm sorry, Intra ID, um, the new name for Azure Active Directory, um, and kind of go down that path. So anyway, um, so what we want to do is we want to talk about on-prem AD, we want to talk about intra ID, um, and then we want to talk about the attacks themselves and, and kind of what's going on. So let's first of all decrypt this whole concept of on-prem Active Directory password policies. I have given this presentation over 100 times. Yes, it's the year 2023, but I guarantee someone is gonna learn something in the next couple of slides and as we go through this, because it is probably one of the most complicated and misunderstood parts of Active Directory, which is the password policy, okay? So let's go over some basics. First of all, the password policy for Active Directory for a domain is configured in the default domain policy, okay? It must be, it being the password policy, must be configured in a GPO linked to the domain. That is a requirement, all right? Now, this particular password policy controls a couple of different things, okay? First of all, 
it controls all of the user accounts in Active Directory. So every user account within Active Directory, whatever the password policy is set to by default, that user adheres to that password policy. Secondly, with the way group policy works, the group policy object applies to all of the users, I'm oh, sorry, all of the computers in the domain. Therefore, all of the users in the local SAM on every computer in the domain also adheres to that password policy. So by default with an active directory, every user, domain and local, adheres to one password policy. And that is the one that is set by default in the default domain policy, okay? So if we jump into the default domain policy, and I, nope, not that one. Let's go over here. So here is the default domain policy. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go down here to my policies, my Windows settings, security settings, account policy, password policy. This is the default password policy. Okay, I've not modified this in any way, all right? So this setting applies down through the entire enterprise and every user within the enterprise, by default, adheres to this password policy, okay? Now, let's talk about some details around how the password policy works. So it sets the minimum maximum age. It's gonna set the complexity requirements and is going to establish what the password is by default. Can it be changed? Of course it can be changed. It can be changed within this group policy object, or I can add a new group policy object linked to the domain that has higher precedence than this GPO, and then that group policy object would control the password policy, okay? Now, what if I were to do this? So I'm gonna come down to, let's say, an organizational unit. Let's go to my domain. And you'll see here that I have an OU called USA. Now, a lot of times people say, all right, I wanna have certain users have a different password policy than other users. So I'm gonna to come to an OU that has users, and I'm going to right click, and I'm going to, in the group policy management console, that is, create a new GPO, right? And this is gonna be the password policy two. So in password policy two, go to the same location within the group policy object, my account policy, my password policy, and let's say that I wanna have my minimum password length be, let's say, 12 characters. Okay, so I want all the users in this OU to have a 12 character password policy. So I apply that, and I'm done, okay? How many of you now think that Cleo, Hercules, and Maximus, my pets, if you wanna guess my password, go for it, right? <laughs> Hercules and his birthday, right? How many of you think that these three users now when they reset their password, we'll have to put in a 12 character password. Okay? Doesn't work that way. Does not work that way. These users will adhere to the password policy in the default domain policy. Let me prove it, okay? First of all, I'm gonna go back to the GPO, right? Right here, password policy two. And I'm gonna go into the password policy. Which is right here, and I set it to 12. And notice which objects the password policy applies to. Computers. Is Hercules a computer? It cannot apply to Hercules. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible, okay? 
The password policy applies to computers. And the way that I look at it is it becomes a filter for the database on that computer where users are stored. It actually doesn't apply to users. It applies to computers. Okay? So by default, every user in this domain applies to one password policy. It's just the way it works. Okay? So if you are responsible for your password policy and you think that you have applied a password policy to know you to apply to users in there, I suggest you create a, another user and test it because I guarantee you it will not work that way. It does not work that way. It hasn't worked that way for 13 years. Okay? Now, one password policy per domain and you have no control over any other parameters of the password policy. The password policy is the password policy unless you get a third party tool. So those settings that are in that password policy, you can't do anything else. For example, complexity says that you have to have three of the four character types, lowercase, uppercase, number, and special. If you want to require all four in a password, you cannot do that with Microsoft technology. You can't. You have to get a third party tool. Right? And again, the password policy for the domain users must be linked to the domain. But let's talk quickly about what in the world is this group policy object going to affect, okay? Password policy two, this one right here, linked to the USA OU. What would it affect? Remember, the password policy affects which objects? Computers. Computers. So which computers would it affect? Every computer that's in the USAOU will now have a 12-character minimum password, meaning all of the local users and the local SAM on all of those computers will require 12 characters. Okay? That's how the password policy works. But all the domain users still are going to adhere to whatever is linked to that domain. Now, obviously we have this other default GPO, the default domain controllers policy. Does it include controls for the password policy in that GPO? Let's go look. I'm getting mixed reactions, so let's go look. Ah, there they are. If I were to configure these settings in here, would these settings modify the domain users? Where must the GPO be linked for domain users? At the domain. This one's linked at the domain controllers OU. And yes, I fully understand the domain controllers' computers are in this OU, uh, but welcome to Microsoft. Doesn't work that way, okay? The only way that users can have a password policy apply to them, domain users, is in a GPO linked to the domain. It's just the way it is. This will do absolutely nothing. If I configure anything in here, it does nothing. Unless I put a different computer, let's say a server, in the domain controllers' OU, then that computer's local SAM would adhere to this, but not domain controllers, right? Very confusing. And it's just going to get a little bit more confusing as we go through, right? Because welcome to Microsoft, right? Now, if I want to have multiple password policies in the same domain, I can do that with Microsoft technology. I just can't do it with GPOs. I do it with something called fine-grained password policies, okay? Also referred to as a PSO, or password setting object, right? But these are not in-group policy objects. 
up until Microsoft released the, uh, the admin center, you had to do it in ADSI edit, okay? Now, you can do it through ADSI edit, you can do it through uh, the admin center, you can even do it with PowerShell if you also wanted to, kind of painful, but you can, all right? Now, the same settings are inside of a PSO. So if I were to open up a GPO and a PSO, they would have the same controls, right? Minimum age, maximum age, history, all of that. I cannot add additional settings to a fine-grained password policy. I have the same. All it allows me to do is say, this side of the room, you get one password policy, this side of the room, you get a different password policy. All right? And you control who receives it by permissions. It's referred to as PSO applies to, right? So if I go into my admin center, right here is where I can configure my password setting object, okay? It's kind of nice, it's actually a GUI now inside of the admin center, because when you went through ADC edit, it was kind of a wizard. It walked you through and said, what do you want for this? What do you want for this? And it was brutal, because you had to put in the correct syntactical entry, which was not obvious, right? But this is how you create new ones, and you can see here is where you set it to apply to, right? So now you can have multiple password policies in the same domain, allowing IT to have, let's say, a 14-character password, maybe you have developers have a 12-character password, and then the C-level has a two-character password, because that's all they can handle, right? Okay. But, what's that? Oh, of course never expires, that's obvious, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? But of course IT, let's also not expire those, because we're king of the hill and we just want to do that, right? Okay, so, PSO applies to users and global groups, okay? Can't add additional things, and it becomes an object. It is actually an Active Directory object. It is not a GPO. It is completely separate, completely different technology. But both work side by side. So which one applies? If I do not have a PSO at all, then every user gets the password policy from the GPO. If I have a PSO, a fine grade password policy, and a user has permissions to it, it will receive the settings in the PSO. If the user doesn't have permissions to it, it defaults over to the group policy object. If I'm a user and I have permissions to multiple password setting objects, which is possible, right? I'm going to receive the one that has the highest priority. So when you establish new password setting objects, you have to set a priority for it. I normally start with 10, that way I can have nine that have higher priority and the rest have lower priority. That way when users have a multitude, they're gonna get the one that has the highest priority. Okay? But it always defaults back to whatever that GPO setting is if I don't have permissions to any of them. Now, I'm going to go over a couple of different uh, PowerShell commands. Don't worry about writing them down. Just write down my email and I'll send you a, a block of PowerShell commands that allow you to look at certain things, okay? So if I come in here and I go to PowerShell and I run my password policy per user, this is going to show me which password policy applies to each user, okay? You will notice Resultant PSO, nothing shows up. So which password policy are these users getting? The GPO. the GPO. And if they had permissions to a PSO, it would show the one that they have the highest priority to. Very easy to look at, but you have to look at this. I beg you to go look at this, especially if your organization is using fine-grained password policies. Because a lot of organizations don't understand exactly how it all works, and they don't have the password policy they think is in place 
because of permissions or they don't understand the way that the, the GPO works in comparison or, or any of the details, okay? All right, any questions on that? Fantastic. Oh, sure. When you mean that the user has permissions. I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat it, yeah. If you, when you mean that the user has permissions to the PSO, what if that exactly means? That, because they have to be part of a group to, to attach yep. that, but the permissions, where, where is exactly that layer? Okay, so the question is, what, permissions in a PSO, where, how does that all work? Okay, so I'm gonna go back into my admin center, and when I create a new password setting object, right here is where I configure the user and or group that has access. So that's the permission. This is the permission right here, okay? The PowerShell command that I ran says, show me the resultant. So if I have permission to five different PSOs, it's only gonna show the one that's in control for that user, which may be different for another user, okay? Fantastic. Thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, intra ID. Still weird to say that, right? It's Azure AD. Or I, I am, th th there's a clear split on the rename. You either love it or you hate it. I don't know if too many people are like, yeah, I'm indifferent, okay? I am on the love it side because I've been around AD for a while, let's say 24 years. Yes, I know it's 23 years old, but I was dealing with it kind of before. It never should have been called Active Directory. Ever. It's not Active Directory, okay? There is nothing at all similar to on-prem AD and Azure AD, nothing. It shouldn't have been called AD to begin with, okay? So it was a rename coming. It should have been renamed a long time ago, all right? But intra-ID, in my opinion, is almost just as confusing for its password policy as on-prem AD, okay? You cannot configure the password policy like you do on-prem. This is micro, is there anyone working for Microsoft in here? Because I'm not gonna change what I say, I just, start. I'm just gonna know who to talk to. Microsoft does a lot of things foolishly, primarily for one reason. And what's that one reason? Money. Thank you, we're all on the same page, right? To make money and they do it through their marketing machine. This is a perfect example of that, a perfect example. They don't want you to mess with the password policy. Why? Does anyone want to take a stab at that one? Why doesn't Microsoft want you to deal with the password policy in intra-ID? Mess it up in the public No, 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 that's, a, that's not a money thing. Why? M-F-A. They want you to get intra ID because it has MFA. And they're stripping away the ability for you to control multiple password policies because they want you to use MFA. And the only way to get MFA? Right. Subscribe. It's the absolute truth. I don't care what anyone at Microsoft says. It's the absolute truth and I'm gonna prove it to you in just a minute, okay? Now, you can also use the on-prem password policy if you set up AD Connect, okay? If you connect on-prem with and create a hybrid, now you can actually point users back to the on-prem and get some of those controls, okay? Now, the password policy for intra-ID is this, okay? It's a little clunky. Minimum eight characters. What's on-prem? What's the, what's the default? Seven, okay? That seven and eight is very important. We're gonna talk about that, okay? Three to the four of the following, okay? Um, password expires, doesn't expire. By default, it doesn't expire. We'll come back to that. Duration, 90 days, um, only when password expires is enabled. Um, right, this can be changed. The rest of these, except for one, can't be changed. It, it just, it's just crazy, you cannot change these. This is set. Microsoft said, this is the way it is. Okay, because they want you to use MFA. Sorry. Okay. Now, Microsoft also provides a list 
of words that users can't use. And there's two lists, okay? There's a list you cannot see. That list is not publicized. Why? Because it's dynamic. It's 500 words that Microsoft in the background analyzes constantly and updates for you. They have no idea what's on the list. They have no idea. Okay? If you want to create a list, that's where you go in here and create your custom list. That has a maximum of 1,000 words. Okay? Not really that robust. How many passwords in the last 10 years have been posted on the internet? Enough. <laughs> millions upon millions. Well, Microsoft says, I'm gonna use 1,500. Yay! It's, it's, it's a feeble attempt. It is an absolute feeble attempt. But they also go in and say, hey, we're going to allow AD to use this list. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to use lists, go get a third-party tool. Completely honest, right? Just go get a third-party tool. Because this is not the way to secure passwords, in my opinion. Okay? It's a good first try, but how long has Azure AD been out there? A long time. And they're not going to update it. They do not want their engine looking through thousands of passwords to deny a user to put in that password. Now, if you read some of the documentation, sometimes a user can actually put in a password that contains one of those words, okay? There is a very sophisticated engine, according to Microsoft, of why that's possible. They're going through multiple iterations of the risk of the password. And if the password meets other criteria, undocumented criteria, you can actually have a password that includes that word. It's not just that word, it's other parts of it, but it includes that. Very strange, okay? Now, I, I pulled it out of this deck, but the, and I challenge you to go look at this, right? If you go and search on Azure AD password policy, you are gonna get a list of what Microsoft recommends for their password policy. They're gonna recommend eight characters. They're gonna recommend that the user never change the password. And they're in agreement with NIST on this. But what they do not say in this document is that's only if you have MFA. They do not say that. They do not say Use MFA if you're going to allow the password to exist forever and never be changed. All right? You have to have that. You have to have that. Yes, question. I'll repeat it. Okay. Um, so, nowhere in MD65 is there a place to set the minimum password length? Correct. It's not configurable. But if you have AD Connect, yes. you can then set a fine grained password policy that. Yes, yes, so the question is, within, again, naming Microsoft 365 or Office 365, whatever we want to call it today, right, you cannot set some of these parameters. But what you can do is if you have hybrid, right, you can come in here and say, I'm going to have my users use the password policy from on-prem. And now they will actually get that, okay? Very confusing in my opinion. This is in Azure AD, Intra ID. This is not the admin center on prem. This is the cloud. This is Azure AD. Okay. Great question. Okay. All right. Let's talk about attacks. So I, I can't list them all here, but this is some common attacks, right? The first one, if you didn't know it, it's still possible. 
If you delete the SAM file in reboot, what does it do on reboot? It creates a new SAM file. How convenient. Okay? And it has default credentials in there. It's just the craziest thing in the world. You can still do this. Now, of course, it would be for a server. I mean, but it's, it's still kind of crazy that's possible. Dual boot scenarios, right? You, you can do a dual boot, right, on the same machine. You go into the other files because you have access to them because you're admin over here. You can go to these files, and now you can access those. It's, you can do this. So physical security is a thing, extremely important. Social engineering, right, phishing attacks. Still number one. Why? Well, we got users. If anyone, if anyone figures out how to get rid of users, our job would be a lot easier. But we can't get rid of users, right? Impersonation, this is a big one. All right, we're not gonna go into the details of this, but let me just throw out some different things here where impersonation comes in, right? I can do pass the hash attacks. I can do pass the ticket attacks. You've all heard of golden tickets, right? Have you ever heard of a sapphire or diamond ticket? That's impersonation. They are modifying the ticket. They're not creating a new one. They're modifying a ticket. Kerber roasting. Okay? All of these are attacks against authentication protocols and the properties of those tickets, tokens, passwords. Okay? Then we get into password guessing. And then we get into password cracking. So let's first of all talk about password spraying, right? referred to as low and slow. Right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the same password and I'm gonna apply that to every single user, the one password to every user, okay? Why only one password? Because I don't wanna trigger the account lockout. I don't wanna trigger anything in the SIM. So low and slow. Right? And I'm just waiting for that one password to work. Very, very, very common. If your SIM is not set up for this today, get it set up for this today. Okay? Because no one in the organization can get out of this. Oh no, I, 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 yeah, I just tried one password against every user. I was, I was testing something. You need this to come through your SIM. There's technology to look for this stuff. It's very simple. Get it in the SIM. Have your SOC be alerted to this, okay? You also have brute force guessing. Not nearly as common, why? They don't want to trigger the account lockout. But it's still possible. And here, they're just trying a multitude of passwords against the same account. They may know a root of it, right? I know it's password, but I don't know if it's password one, password two, password three, so I'm gonna try all of them, okay? So these are things that are possible and they, they occur all the time, right? Microsoft, you can go out to Microsoft's website and look at their analytics about how many times accounts are being attacked. It's extraordinary, okay? Because people have access to them. Can your own employees do this to the internal database? Of course they can, right? Now, I don't talk about this a lot. Not that I'd ever do this or I've ever seen it, but let's say you have a disgruntled employee, okay? Can they go to their, right? so I'll kind of go off the cuff here. Can they go to their command line and do net accounts and get the details of the password policy? Okay. So they get details of the password policy. So this is telling them the lockout threshold, the lockout duration, and the observation window. It's telling them how many times someone can put in a wrong password before they're locked out. So let's say that I just create a small little script that logs everyone in five times because the threshold is four, 
and then I point to the list of users. Can I get a list of every user in Active Directory as a normal user? Yes. So I have a script that logs every user in five times. What does that do to every user? It locks every user out. Don't do this at work, please. Don't blame me. I didn't think, maybe I thought it up a little bit. But I've seen this happen. I've done this, okay? So these are the kind of things that you need to think about. Okay, then we get into password cracking, all right? And there are a multitude of options. Primarily, there's a brute force attack. There's dictionary attacks, rainbow table attacks, and then there's even more, okay? Now, when I get into tools, right, and I'm gonna show you Kane here, right? Kane allows me to go in and say, all right, I can do a dictionary attack. Right click, boom, I bring in one or more dictionaries and now I, I scan through that. Super simple. I can do brute force attacks. Okay. Now, when I do a brute force attack, right? It allows me to go in and pick my character set. Allows me to go in and pick minimum and maximum length. I'm gonna guess that 95% of the organizations represented in here, your minimum password length is between six and 10 characters. No. So, what do I put in here? The norm, right? I'm, get, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in the norm, right? Default is seven. Some people go to eight because that's important because of land manager, because land manager, right, has a 14 character password broken into two seven character parts. Going from seven to eight is that leap, right? And then I have the ability to come in here and do cryptography attacks, rainbow tables. And if you don't have a rainbow table, that's okay. You can just run the tool and it'll create your own rainbow table. It'll create a rainbow table, which is a pre-hash table, it's a hash table. So now you don't have to actually try to decrypt or encrypt anything, create a hash, the hash is just there, you do a comparison, right? And you'll notice that in order to get hashes in here, I simply right clicked and I added to the list, and I added to the list from the computer I'm on. But if I have a SAM database, if I have a database, I can just import it in here, and boom, I'm ready to go. Now, there are other ways to crack passwords, and I know there's a lot of words on here, but I, I went through and I'm like, I wanna keep it. You can, get, you can get the PowerPoint, okay? But this is from a German company called DTAC, and basically what they have created is a way to crack passwords based on some phenomenal criteria, right? So this is including enterprise data, corporate branding, names of people, addresses. So they put this in a database, they suck it out of the website, throw it in a database, and that's part of the word list, okay? Then they look at passwords leaked over the last 20 years in a database. And then they use the above methods as well as create new dynamic dictionaries. And then they'll append numbers and, and do all these weird gyrations. They can crack passwords up to literally about 20 characters long in a couple of days. Really cool stuff, right? Primarily they do an audit on your AD and tell you, hey, you're, <laughs> You're really messed up here, and over here, maybe these three users are okay. But most users' passwords are crackable, okay? So you need MFA, but you can't get rid of passwords, especially for service accounts, right? There are certain accounts you cannot get rid of passwords. So when people say, have the entire enterprise go passwordless, mm, not possible. It's not gonna work, right? You can't get rid of those service accounts. And as last I checked, no service account has any fingers to check their phone. 
So we're kind of stuck, okay? So how do we protect passwords? What can we do? Well, first of all, we can kill LM and NTLM, right? There are four authentication protocols. Lane Manager, NTLM, NTLM v2. You can't kill NTLM v2 in almost every situation. And Kerberos, right? Can't kill Kerberos. So you need these two, but you can kill these others. So there is a GPO setting that allows you to go in and control LM and NTLM, right? Now, notice the default is send NTLM response only, but you gotta consider this is a domain control that is set to, so it functions differently. So what I did is I put the details in here, zero, one, two, these are the registry entries the match up to those, and it describes what those settings do. It's only when you get to four and five that it actually controls the authenticating server. So you have to be down at four and five. And you'll notice four and five are the ones that say refuse. Refuse lane manager, refuse LM and NTLM. The other ones look like, but they're not. They're still allowing lane manager and NTLM, okay? The most important thing about a password is length. It's length. Nothing else matters. Complexity doesn't matter. All lowercase, I don't care. 20 plus characters. You gotta have it that long in order to create a more secure password. Length is the most important thing. Sure, complexity is in there, but the technologies today can crack it when it's shorter, whether it has complexity or not. But length is the most important thing. My recommendation is passphrases. Start with a capital, end with a period. It's a sentence, right? I don't know, use your favorite quote from a book, from a song, from a speech, from whatever, I don't care. It's easier to type, it's easier to remember. Passphrases, 20 plus characters. Studies have been done on passphrases. They normally go over 25 characters for passwords, right? And it meets complexity requirements. Uppercase, lowercase, special. It's a sentence, okay? I know we didn't go over everything with passwords and, and, and attacks, but I only had 45 minutes. Any questions? If you do have any questions afterwards, please, there's my email. More than happy to address questions. Yes? The BrainCore email is still valid. <laughs> <laughs> it is. BrainCore is still valid, yes. I actually had to change it for this because it was the other one. Yeah, BrainCore has been around for a long time. Yes? I don't know if you can talk about it or not, but is there any alternatives to use a password protection besides Microsoft? Like okay, Linux? the question is, is there any technologies to use for password protection other than Microsoft? Um, one of the best that I've seen it's from a company called SpecOps, S-P-E-C-O-P-S. It integrates with group policy, and it gives you every possible permutation you ever want for password controls. It's unbelievable. It's been around for 20 years. SpecOps? Yep, SpecOps. It's called password policy. <laughs> no, no, that's SpectreOps. Yeah, S-P-E-C-O-P-S. That's a really cool tool, too. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. If you do have any questions and want to come up and ask, I'll be around. Um, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.